All right. Hi, welcome to a new unit in SI-335. Um, we're getting towards closer and closer to the end of the semester, and we have an important unit now on graph algorithms. So you've seen graphs before in data structures class, but for some of us, it's been a little while, so we'll kind of review some of the things that you need to know, but you also might need to go back and review some of your notes from data structures as well to kind of uh, so, so that we can get up to speed and get to work here. So this is a bunch of terminology. We'll go over all this, but a graph is one of these pictures where we have connections between nodes and we have, um, so the nodes are these circles. Those are also called vertices. Vertices is the plural of vertex. Um, and the edges are the lines between them. Um, sometimes they have a direction, like an arrow, like these do. And then we have uh, weight, so sometimes the edges have numbers associated with them. And that's called a weight. And uh, a path is a way to get from one node to, the, to another one. So like here's a path from this node. We can follow this edge, then this edge, then this edge. And so that makes a path like from this node to that one, even though there's no direct edge between them. And a cycle would be like, we can see a cycle right here, um, a path that, that goes back onto itself. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll be using this terminology if, if you wanna pause and make sure that you're on top of this. Um, this should be uh, terminology that you're basically familiar with, but we'll, we'll get a lot of practice with using it. Um, so why do we care about graphs? There's a lot of different problems. So I have uh, a few examples here of different kinds of graphs that we could think about and we can kind of start to imagine some problems that we would do with those graphs. So let me also show you some examples from the web. So here's OpenStreetMap, which is like a open source version of uh, Google Maps. And I want to bike from Bancroft Hall at the Naval Academy to Key West, as I'm sure all of you do. And there's uh, some different ways we can do it. So if I, if I type this in, it very quickly identifies, here's the optimal route with like, I don't know how many turns, probably hundreds or thousands of little turns um, between here all the way through, uh, you know, like five states, all the way down to Key West, Florida. And it's able to do this really quickly. Uh, notice that this, this algorithm is called Graph Hopper. There's a second way that I can get um, directions in OpenStreetMaps, a different algorithm called open, open source routing mechanism, I think. Um, routing machine, okay. And this notice takes actually a quite a different path. Um, and what I thought was interesting is that it tells you to take a ferry instead of going down uh, Highway 1 to get to Key West. But anyway, um, both of those came back really quickly. What are they doing is they're treating every potential location like an intersection as a node in a graph. And the road between those nodes is an edge that has some weight according to how long it'll take. And that's why it's different for bicycle versus walking versus car, because um, the amount of time, the weight on an edge will be different with a car than it will be for a bicycle. That's why if you, if you choose bicycle directions, you'll usually see like a more direct route um, or definitely walking, as opposed to with a car, it might prefer to go on highways because a car can go much faster on a highway, whereas a bike, they're going to assume that you're pretty much going the same speed no matter what kind of road it is. And this is a massive graph. If you imagine how many roads and how many intersections there are in not only the US, but I mean, I could have this go to, um, I don't know, some place in to Buenos Aires. Um, ah, okay, so it, it, can't, it can't find a, maybe by car we can drive there. I don't know. Okay, I guess there's some kind of gap. Um, but anyway, the, the point is, uh, you can go between countries, I'll say Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and so you can go between different countries. So it, it has, if you can imagine how many roads and how many intersections there are in all the countries of the world, it's a massive, massive graph. And still within a couple seconds, it's able to come back with this um, route, whatever I put in. And so there's a couple different algorithms here. This is the open source routing machine. And if you look this up, it'll tell you how it works. It's based on something, uh, 
based on Dijkstra's, multi-level Dijkstra's, whatever that means, and contraction hierarchies. Um, this is the graph hopper algorithm, which is a, another one that's available, and they have all kinds of things, and they talk about, okay, what algorithms are using some combination of Dijkstra's and A star with contraption hierarchies. Um, so interesting stuff. Um, that's one example of a graph problem that's pretty big, where we want to think about what are efficient and effective algorithms to use. Uh, that's something that you've probably seen before, graph search. Um, something that you might not have thought about as much before is um, like scheduling problems. So you may have used like apt, apt get or apt install um, in Ubuntu to install packages on Linux, whether it's running in your virtual machine or some other way. And if you notice whenever you want to install a new package, a lot of times it tells you, oh, you have to install these other packages. So here's an example of a package that's actually the one that's used to draw the graphs that I'm using in this unit. And you can see that it depends. So all these red dots are a dependency on some other package. And most of them are libraries. So, it, OK, it must be written in C. It depends on the basic C libraries. But it also depends on this one for nearest neighbor searching. And this one for graph drawing um, and some GCC stuff. OK, so all these things um, graph viz depends on. And so when you ask to install graph viz, what Ubuntu has to figure out is, OK, it has to somehow install these ones first before it can fully install GraphViz, because GraphViz depends on these. But then there's there's some interesting connections. So like if I click on this approximate nearest neighbor search, you see that this one also depends on libc6 and also depends on GCC. Um, and GraphViz also depends on uh, libc6. So there's all these kind of like interesting connections between how could you organize. So what do we have is um, we have the all these packages are like a node. So anything that you might want to install one of these libraries like GraphViz is like a node. And then the thing that it depends on, that's an edge to another node saying, I have to install this node first. And so if I have this graph and I say, I want this one, and you are able to, your operating system knows here's the packages that you already have installed, then it has to do some kind of a search to like figure out which packages you need and then some other algorithm to figure out what order would make sense to install them first. Because like I think here probably libc6 would have to be installed pretty early on um, because that's a dependency of many of these other uh, libraries. Um, so how can it do that? How can it figure that out? What's an effective way um, to make that decision? That's another thing to think about. Totally different problem, which will kind of uh, hint on something related to this at the end of this unit is uh, matching organ donors. We actually have a top researcher in our math department, um, Professor Gentry, does a lot of work in this area. Um, and so I've learned a little bit, tiny bit about this from her and her students. Um, but the, the matching problem, so if something happens and you need a kidney, there's an algorithm that gets run to when someone else is an organ donor um, has a, you know, uh, unfortunately dies or, or gives one up or something, and there's a kidney available, there's an algorithm that gets used to decide who gets that kidney. And it has to work quickly, um, but it also has to be kind of like open and fair so that people, you know, it's, you shouldn't be able to like uh, slip the doctor some extra money and now you get a kidney. So there's, there's all kinds of notions of fairness here. And so they, they describe the process. And basically for these different organs, there's different scoring mechanisms depending on these kind of things like how, how severe is your disease? How likely are you to be helped by getting this transplant? Um, how close are you? Because some organs don't last very long. So you have to, you maybe need to be physically close and like ready to get it. Uh, and so an algorithm is run whenever there's an organ that's available. This algorithm gets run to match um, organs to potential uh, recipients and then to ask them, hey, do you want this? Do you want this? And so that's kind of a graph matching problem where we have organs and we have um, potential people that need the organ and we're trying to match them up in a fair and efficient process so that everybody, hopefully as many people as possible, can actually receive an organ. Okay, so those are all some examples of um, graph problems that come in a lot of different guises, and, and there's, so there's a lot of interesting problems for us to work with here. Um, so first thing we need to ask is, what is actually the graph? We've, we can draw these pictures, but of course it has to get stored in a computer. 
Um, and, and so we'll get more practice with what all these things mean, but there's really two main representations, an adjacency matrix or adjacency list representation. So an adjacency matrix, um, the main thing here is that it's, it's uh, highly organized as just a table. So it's an n by n matrix, like a 2D array that just stores um, for every entry, stores the weight of that edge between that um, pair of vertices. And so really basically, so this is a size uh, n squared representation. Um, so it's a little bit larger representation, but it's also very simple. You can look up any edge in constant time because it's just looking up uh, an entry in a 2D array. So it's a little bit big, um, but it's also fast to access. And so it's good when you have a lot of edges. When most of the edges in the graph actually exist, this is going to be the, probably the best way to, to represent it. Adjacency list representation, on the other hand, is we just have an array of lists, or maybe even a hash table of lists. And then each um, list has a node weight pair. So it's like a list of, of lists. And so the, the point here is that it doesn't store the edges which don't exist. So the total size is going to be like big theta of n plus m, where n is the number of nodes uh, that we've already kind of been using. So this is the number of nodes in the graph, and m is the number of edges. So notice that the adjacency matrix representation doesn't depend on the number of edges because it pretty much kind of assumes that every edge, every possible edge exists, and there's um, big theta of n squared possible edges, whereas an adjacency list, it only stores the edges which actually exist. So what's the downside here is that it's going to be slower to a little bit slower to look things up. So um, so that you can think of adjacency lists as smaller, um, but maybe slower to look up an individual edge. And then I mentioned this third one, although we're not going to really focus on it, is that in, in some cases we have like implicit graphs, meaning we don't explicitly store the whole graph in the computer as a, one of these representations, but you kind of compute the edges as you go. Um, and so that, that, um, that kind of idea is used a lot in AI, and if you're taking the AI class, you've probably seen some discussion of that, um, but we won't really focus on that as much here for our class. And then our graphs can be weighted or unweighted. So do the edges have weights or not? And they can be directed or undirected. Another way of saying that is that an undirected graph is just every edge goes in both directions. Um, so we can really use these, even though these are kind of assuming we have a weighted and directed graph, we can also use them to store unweighted graphs where our edge weights are zero or one. And we can also use them for undirected graphs where um, edges go in both directions. Okay, so here's a simple example, a small example with five nodes. So let's first say there's five nodes, A, B, C, D, E, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, seven edges, so M equals seven. There's a, we're always gonna be thinking about N and M, the number of nodes and the number of edges. So the adjacency matrix representation is for every edge that gets stored somewhere in here. So I see an edge from A to D of weight 22. So that's going to put a 22 in this entry. There's an edge from A to C with length 10. So I can put that there. Um, and there's an edge from C to A of length 21. So that's going to be kind of on the other side, um, filling that in. Okay, so similarly for all of these, so um, I'll just fill these in. Okay, so here's all the edges that we see there filled in but now in the in the adjacency matrix so for an adjacency list this is really all we would have we would have a list of like um a b c d e and then each one of those would be a sub list of um would be would be a list of all the outgoing edges from there so a has an outgoing edge from to d at length 22 and an outgoing edge to C at length 10. And then in the second entry of this adjacency list, B has an outgoing edge to C of length 53 and to uh, E of length 45. 
And some of these lists will be empty. So for example, um, D doesn't have any outgoing edges. So that adjacency list for D would just be an empty list. Okay, so that's what the adjacency list representation looks like. But for the adjacency matrix, we also need to fill in these empty parts. We can't just have an empty thing in array. There's got to be something there. And so usually what we do, if we're especially if we're talking about like paths and searching, is everything along the diagonal, like what's A to A, if we're thinking of these as being distances, the distance from any node to itself is really zero. So that's usually what we put... Um, this is called the diagonal of the matrix. So for B to B, C to C, D to D, everything to itself is just zero. And then the other spots, so you can think about like, well, what's the distance from A? What's the, the length of the edge from A to E? There is no length, though, no edge from A to E. And again, if we're thinking about like these things as being distances and like traveling along those, then what makes usually most sense is to put infinity everywhere else. And infinity, when it's actually is representable um, if you use doubles or floats. You can actually have infinity, believe it or not. And if you're using something else, like if these are ints, then maybe you use negative one to represent infinity. Um, but in any case, that's what we'll store. Uh, so we'll use some kind of thing to represent that, hey, this, this edge doesn't exist, you know, B to D doesn't exist. So we, we represent that numerically as an infinity because we have to fill in the whole matrix. And so what you see is that the matrix, the adjacency matrix uses more things because it's got to fill in all these edges that aren't there. But then it's also kind of simpler. If we want to look up any edge, it's, it's faster. Um, okay, so the first problem we're going to look at, and uh, again, you, you have seen this before in previous classes, so we're just kind of uh, going to gloss over some previous algorithms you know and then talk about something new that's based on dynamic programming since that's the most recent topic is graph search. So you can think of graph search as having what I call a fringe or like an unexplored part. Start with just a starting vertex and then every time you go through you take something out of the fringe, uh, mark that one as visited, then add its neighbors into the fringe and then just keep doing that until the fringe is empty. So if we're trying to search from A to D, we would start with A in the fringe um, then we take that out and add all its neighbors, so all its outgoing neighbors like C and D into the fringe. And then we have to pick one of those, and kind of how we pick that is really what um, is going to determine which kind of search we have. So maybe I pick C next, so then all the outgoing neighbors of C get added, and then maybe I pick D next, and that's actually my destination. Um, so then this tells me that my path is just this, taking this direct line um, from A to D, or maybe, uh, yeah, because I didn't explore E yet. So again, depending on the, or the, the order that we remove things from the fringe really depends on what kind of a search it's going to be. Um, but this is the general idea behind um, depth-first search, breadth-first search, and Dijkstra's algorithm that you should remember from data structures class. And so what's the difference is really this, this question of... Um, how do we remove the next unvisited vertex? So this is the, the question. This is going to work in different ways depending on the algorithm. And so with depth first search, we use a stack for the fringe. So that means that the, every time which vertex do we remove is the most recently added vertex. And in breadth first search, we use a queue. So that means we're going to remove the least recently added. And again, you should remember these things and they, they cause a different pattern of how that search proceeds. And then in Dijkstra's algorithm, which is really for finding shortest paths, um, you should remember that you use a priority queue, as in like a heap. So heap is the most common data structure for a priority queue. Um, and that means that each time we're going to store the closest, the closest vertex from the starting point.
Um, so not depending on the order that it was added, but depending on actually those distances. But so basically these three, Death First Search, Breath First Search, and Dijkstra's algorithm are all kind of the same algorithm um, following this pattern. But the difference is how do they remove the next vertex? Um, so what data structure do they use for that um, removal? And so that's why you learn about these things in data structures class. Okay, so we'll kind of um, remember what these, how these worked, but we're going to not really focus on these particular algorithms because you have learned about them already. Um, but we're going to look at a, a slightly different version of this searching problem that uses dynamic programming. And so that'll be the next thing that we talked about. Talk about. So just as a review, what have we talked about today is we have graphs. They're useful for a lot of different things. I've kind of given you a hint at some of the cool graph problems that we want to be thinking about and just reminding ourselves and trying to get back in up to speed with this terminology that computer scientists uh, used to describe graphs like vertices and edges and weights and direction um, and how we represent them in the computer. Okay, great.